Konnichiwa and welcome to episode 56 of the Leadership Japan series and I am your host in Tokyo, Dr. Greg Story, President of Dale Carnegie Training Japan and much more importantly, you are a student of leadership, highly motivated to be the best in your own business field. If you enjoy the program, then you might consider subscribing on iTunes. Also, if you would like your own access to 102 years of the accumulated wisdom of Dale Carnegie training through our free white papers, free guidebooks, reports, training videos, blogs, course information, plus, 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 then go to japan.dalecarnegie.com. Today, we are going to hear a presentation on how to build a culture of engagement in your organization. We will begin. So thank you very much for coming. My name is Greg Story. I'm the president of Dale Carnegie Training Japan. And we're going to run through organizations and pride in organizations and the culture around that today. And this is actually the fourth of a series of these engagement seminars and workshops we've been doing. And they've all had different themes. And we're working through the elements of that. And today, it's around pride the organization. That'll be our main, our main game. But let me just take us through a few things first. Uh, some of you will probably know about Dale Carnegie. Some of you may not. But we're going to look at how great organizations create a culture of engagement. Right? And the book on the left there is the original cover they used in 1936 when they issued How to Win Friends and Influence People, which has been a phenomenal bestseller, an incredible long seller. And the one on the right was issued a couple of uh, years ago as an update, looking at making it more relevant in the digital age in which we work. And the Japanese versions have sold 9 million copies of uh, Hitoko Kasu. Now they've just released Hitoko Kasu 2 uh, as the equivalent of that uh, digital age book. So very, very well accepted and popular in Japan. And we're very fortunate that 90% of the Fortune 500 companies are using Dale Kennedy for their training. And I found that there are about 64, welcome, please join us. Sorry. That's fine. About 64 Japanese companies in the Fortune 500. And I noticed that about half of them are our clients here in Japan. And so we uh, actually work across the globe. We bring training to 91 countries around the world and we teach in 30 languages. And the beauty of this is for our clients where they might uh, develop a, a training uh, content or a customised training program in one country and they want to take it all around the world, they can do that. We're currently doing a... Uh, welcome, please, come on in. We're doing a 34-country rollout now of a particular uh, program of multiple trainings for a Danish company. And so the beauty of this is they designed it in Denmark, but it rolls out in 34 countries around the world under the various languages. So it's a very, very great help to clients who want to take their training global. And uh, we're very fortunate. To, I think everyone knows that Warren Buffett is one of the most famous successful business people in history. I mean, you know, if you'd bought into uh, his company 30 years ago, we'd all be billionaires by now. <laughs> it's a phenomenal. And he's a high welcome. He's a big fan, uh, which is great. And, and let's see if we can hear from Warren. Turn this up a bit. Dale Carnegie. I was terrified of public speaking. One day I went to Dale And that's the type of testimonial you'd like to have from a guy as successful as Warren Buffett that this course changed my life. In his case, it did because uh, he was a very smart guy, had these brilliant investment ideas which have all proven to be wonderful, but couldn't get people to come with him. He didn't have the persuasion power. So he took the Dale Carnegie course and, as you say, it changed his life. And that's why he has the diploma 
in the walls of his office, but not his university degrees, because he already got the degrees, but he didn't have the wherewithal or the capacity to persuade and convince people to come with him. So uh, this is a great testimonial for us from, from Warren Buffett. And not only uh, Warren Buffett, but also in Japan, uh, three very well-known business people. In fact, Oitani san who was the ex-chairman of Coca-Cola, is now the president of Shiseido. Uh, just recently became the president of Shiseido. And uh, Murakami san, ex-chairman uh, of Google. And of course, uh, Atara san from Johnson and Johnson. And these three gentlemen uh, all took Dale Carnegie training, and it changed their lives too. And so you'll often see them in print talking about the influence that training had on their careers. Uh, they often give talks, speeches, and they refer to it. And so they're great fans and great supporters. And we've got 9 million graduates uh, globally and about 100,000, uh, over 100,000 now in Japan. So it's quite, quite well established. And about oh, six months ago, I guess, nine months ago now, I noticed that we'd we do surveys of satisfaction rates of all the training. And they're always pretty good, you know, you get the percentages come back, it's always pretty high. And I thought, well, we've never aggregated, we've never put them all together and just take a snapshot of overall everything. So I said to New York, I said, look, put it all in a big bag, all trainers, all seminars, everything, and tell me what the average satisfaction rate is for our training in Japan. And it came back to this number, 97.7% over five years as a consistent average. So that tells us that what we're doing is working for people and is successful. So it's a good indicator. Now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about engagement. There's a very interesting video here I just want to bring up. Well, we talk about one of the themes today being pride in your organisation. What do you think? Do you think that the team at Google seem pretty proud of their organisation? Let's just make a couple of groups. Maybe you can be a, a pair and a three here and a three here and a pair here. How do you think we would go if we brought a film crew into your organisation and we wandered around and we started filming like they did at Google? Would we get that same sense of pride in the organisation, and if so, why, and if not, why not? So please, as a, as a group, make a little discussion group there, and let's hear some of your thoughts. If we were going to get that degree of pride, would we see it or would we not see it? 
And if so, why? And if not, why not? So please discuss that for a couple of minutes. OK, let's just pull it up there and just see how far you got. I'm sure we've, we're going to have a number of discussions today. This will be one of them. But uh, Dennis, how about in your company? If we took a film crew around to your team and we did a type of Google thing there, would we get that same type of feeling? And I don't mean, you know, just the, the words. I mean, you can actually tell that people believe that. They're real, the way they're talking about it. How do you think that would go? Um, so we, we were chatting about how, you know, we're both working for global companies. Mm -hmm. uh, headquarters are outside of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and the offices here in, in Japan are quite small, right? So mm -hmm. like five, ten thousand 10,000 people, uh, global company. But here in, uh, in Japan, it's about 20, 30 people working. Mm -hmm. So it's tough to, you know, there's oftentimes a disconnect from the headquarters and the culture mm -hmm. and to bring it here in Japan. And uh, so I came in mid of last year. And part of it is it's not a high functioning uh, culture mm -hmm. team, right? So part of my role is to uh, help improve the morale, the team, and start getting on a track that's... Uh, High performing, so it'd be uh, the opposite of what, <laughs> what you saw in that. Video. Yeah, at this point in time, right? At this point. Yeah. How about we've got Coca-Cola, which is another big global organisation with a big team here. If we take the film crew around to Coke, are we we get something very similar. Do you think? I think I'm, I'm not so sure. There, there are a lot of Japanese people. They are kind of shy. So shy. I'm huh? not so sure they're going to speak up. Mm -hmm. like that. But we have an employee insert survey for uh, every two years or three years, and then the pride part is very high. Very high, right? Because they've got a big brand name, hasn't it? Very powerful brand name. So if you've got a big brand name like Google, uh, cutting edge technology, it's, it's natural for people to feel a lot of pride in that. As I said, what we work on here is visible around the world. That's a, that's a pretty big thing. Not many people get to do that. So. What we're looking for is what are some things that we can do that are realistic for our size of organizations or structures in Japan that would help people have, have pride. And so in our objectives today, uh, this is on page one of your, your manual, by the way. They were all laid out there for you. But we want to define engagement and look at the impact that getting engagement has on the organization. And a employer of choice model. We're going to look at how we can become an employer of choice. What would be required to get that result? How to build that pride, we can relate that to high performance. And then uh, how to strengthen and maintain engagement once, once it gets going. So when we talk about engagement, we define it as the emotional and intellectual commitment of employees to deliver high performance. Now, that's really the, the mind and the heart. The problem with that is um, often we have people who are very skillful, very knowledgeable, very talented, but they're smart, but they're selfish. They're only interested in themselves, their career, their bonus, their progression. And you know, if they become a leader, the people are just assets for them to move up. You know. So they have all the brain power and skill and ability, but they're a problem in your organization because they're not really engaged. They're like a free agent. They can pack up and move quite easily because they're no loyalty. It's only loyalty to themselves. Or you have the other side, the attitude, the heart. You know, so here, they're sort of happy but hopeless. You know, they're, they're a pleasant person. They're very you know, cheerful. They're a bit of a mood maker maybe. But they don't have the skills. They don't produce the outcomes. So that's no help to us either. So that's not really going to get the type of engagement that we want. Okay? So if we think about it, can we get the person who's got those high level of skills to feel that my abilities are recognised and appreciated in this company? And do they feel the organisation is proud of them? That's something. Now, think about this in your own organisation. Have you felt in your career that your organisation was proud of you? Did you ever have that emotion? Did you ever have that thought that your organisation was proud of you? Okay. So 
we're trying to get engagement where the people are mentally and emotionally engaged, that they feel what they do is relevant and they also feel the organisation is proud. Now, I don't know there are too many organisations where we could go and survey them where the people would say, my organisation is proud of me. And why do you think that is? Why would that be the case? Um, are the organisations just not proud or they don't communicate it or what do you think the breakdown is there? What do you think? I, I would say a lot of times that feedback's not given. So, that, so the organisation may think that they're proud but they're not actively, proactively letting yeah. their employees know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. We, we probably assume, oh, they know we're proud of them, so we don't have to tell them. And I think when you're talking about engagement, if people are going to be engaged, the heart and the mind together, then telling them that their capabilities and skills and experience are appreciated and important, that's a very powerful one, but also tell them we are proud of you. We are really pleased you work here. We are proud of you. Boy, that gets people fired up. That's where you start to get real engagement. Except that often we forget to make people aware of that. We forget to tell them. And so they're doing what they are good at. They're doing what they love to do, what they need to do. Okay. And on top of that, you start getting what we call discretionary effort. Discretionary effort is that extra additional input energy that you outlay beyond what the job spec says or what the company may ask of you. You go beyond that. Very hard to get innovation if you don't get this discretionary effort because if people don't care about the company, why would they care about being innovative? If they don't care about the organisation, why would they make any extra effort to make the system better or to make the customer service better or whatever it might be? So when we start to get the mind and the heart both working together, then we get engagement. But we sometimes miss in the communication around telling people what they um, need to do or how we feel about them. So it's a bit of a lesson for us that we can get high levels of engagement, but we have to work at it a bit harder than perhaps we think. Now, this was a very disturbing set of numbers that came up when we did our global and then regional and then by country survey of engagement. And we found that there was no direct correlation between high levels of satisfaction with the boss and engagement. So, you know, in my case, before I saw these numbers, if I was told, look, Greg, we surveyed your team and they're very satisfied with you as the boss, I would automatically assume, oh, I got high levels of engagement in my team. I just make that assumption. What we found, though, was of those who said, I'm very satisfied with my boss, only half of them were engaged. And of those who said, well, I'm, you know, I'm fairly satisfied, somewhat satisfied with my boss, well, only roughly 20% of those said they were engaged. And those who are not happy, well, you can, you can imagine, right? it's game over for that. So what it tells us is that being very satisfied and being engaged is not the same thing. So we, we might think we're succeeding, we may not be getting the levels of engagement we assume we are getting. This is also very interesting. When people feel their manager cares about them, the one third of those who were surveyed said, yes, I feel my manager cares about me. Well, half of those were engaged. Of those who said two-thirds, no, I don't really feel my manager cares about me, well, only 17% were engaged. So it says we can increase the level of engagement very 
simply, rapidly, if we can have the managers communicating to their team that they care about their people. And we've gone through a few stages, I think, in leadership and management where uh, certainly when I was young and growing up, the concept that the manager would care about the employees was a, a very distant idea. There was a great separation between work and private. There was no mixing of the two. Work is work, private is private. Don't talk about private things at work. But in today's society, that's not the case. People want to know that the manager cares about them in total because they may have relatives, uh, parents are getting older, they might have problems with their kids, you know, different things going on at school. They want the manager to take all that into consideration and care about them, about their work life or non-work balance. They want to know that people care about that. So just by showing that we care, we can change that percentage of engagement very, very quickly. Move the needles, I say there, on the gauge very quickly. Now, Gallup did a study of highly engaged organisations and related it to performance. And in Gallup's study, they found that highly engaged teams outperformed by more than 200% in things like sales, productivity, customer retention. And, uh, you know, you got a higher, nearly 20% higher shareholder return and you had uh, lower turnover. So your costs are lowered. So it certainly translated into a very clear bottom line for companies. And we looked at different levels of engagement. For example, um, the disengaged, partially engaged, and fully engaged. When we looked at the US numbers uh, and then global numbers, they found about 30% of people were engaged, which means they tend to stay longer, they contribute more, they're more passionate about what they're doing. Those who are partially engaged are coming to work, doing their work, and going home. That discretionary effort that I talked about before, not much of that is coming across. They do what they need to do, but not a lot more. There's life after work for them is probably more important than work. But they turn up and they do their job, but that's, that's all. I get paid, go home. Then the disengaged, they're the whiners, the complainers, the ones who get together with everyone around the, you know, the coffee kitchen area and whinge about you, the boss, or complain about the organisation, what it's not doing or it should be doing. And they're basically a source of negativity. So there's a reasonable percentage of those. So when we look at the Japan numbers and we contrast global with APAC and then Japan, we see a really big trend here that you've got a huge number of Japanese who felt disengaged, 77%. And then 22% partially and only 2% engaged. Now, there was a Gallup study done in Japan in 2009, just about uh, a few months actually after the Lehman shock. It wasn't that far after the Lehman shock. And at that time, the uh, engagement score was nine, uh, sorry, 7%, which is still pretty low. Whether ours is 2%, uh, that was, you know, 2012-13, uh, Lehman shock, earthquake, radiation. There's been quite a few big changes in the country. Whether that number's reflecting that or not, I don't know. But whether it was 2% or 7% is not a great number. Anyway, the engagement level is not particularly high as measured around the world comparing Japan. So we have got a bit of work to do still in Japan to try and pick up the pace here. Our study found that there were three drivers for getting engaged. One was very obvious, your direct relationship with your supervisor. Okay, when people leave companies, they usually leave companies, they leave the boss is what they're leaving. That's usually why they leave. Um, so satisfaction with the immediate manager, very important. Belief in the senior leadership, where the senior leaders are taking the company, are we going the right direction, is it all working? And then finally, this is what we're focusing on today, is pride in the organisation. The degree of pride that you felt in the organisation was a driver for engagement. Now, uh, your immediate supervisor, usually middle management, is an issue around getting them to be more caring about people and communicating. And uh, 
senior leadership, their direction, the why of where we're going, getting communicated more clearly has a big impact on engagement. But what often happens, though, the senior leaders communicate the why to the middle managers, but the middle managers fail to pass it down. But somehow it gets sort of trapped there. They forget. They pass on the what and they pass on the how, but not the why. And so even though senior leadership thinks, yes, we're very clearly communicating the direction of the company, our vision for the company, why we're making these changes or why we're taking a particular direction, but they're actually not. Uh, getting it down to the people at the bottom because middle management's not playing the role. So it says that in companies, really need to look at our middle managers to make sure they are playing a very constructive role there. And then who's building the pride in the organisation? Again, this comes down to uh, middle managers have a big role in that, uh, senior managers have a big role in that, but also the awareness that this is an important issue. So I am proud to be here. I can't wait to get to work. That's an engaged employee. They're proud to work in the company and they can't wait to get to work. I mean, you'd like to have every single person in your team operating with that feeling, I'm sure. How do we get that? And what would people say about your organisation to others when you're not there? Now, I'm sure when they're in front of the boss they're going to say nice things about the organisation. What about when the boss is not there? What about when they're outside the company and they're talking to their friends or their relatives about the company? What do they say? So, in your groups again, think about that. What do you think people would be saying about your organisation when you're not there and talking to other people? So, in your groups, please have a discussion and let's hear what you think about that. Okay, let's, uh, let's hear what people thought about that. Yamazaki-san, your company's case. What would your people say about your organisation to others? I guess there are two different types of persons. One is like highly engaged. Mm -hmm. like they're still and what are they going to say? What would they say? I told all the good things about the company. Mm -hmm. And then and I actually recommended one of my um, ex-companies, colleagues, <coughs> to join us because she was looking for it a new growing opportunity. So come and work here. It's a great place to work. It's a strong yeah, recommendation. I, I recommend my friends, um, mm -hmm. not really the family, but mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, you know, the colleagues in the next company to join mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. if they are interested in you know, people new opportunities. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the, on the other hand, the, another type of uh, you know, people in the company actually say some negative thing of the mm -hmm. company, like you know, they're just kind of our... But, managers or partners who are doing these kind of things mm -hmm. to not just to our you know, internal staff but sometimes to the outside, I guess the friend mm -hmm. or not really to the client mm -hmm. which is obviously not engaged. Not engaged group, yeah. Disengaged or possibly partially engaged. So, um, yeah, two different kind of mm -hmm. personality. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about Catherine for you? Um, I was talking to my team here about it depends very much on what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have our, our stakeholders, say our parents, uh, we are a school, so uh, they would look at certain aspects of the school and be very positive, be very engaged. Um, and if you are, let's say, like a kindergarten teacher, right, what they are looking at and be proud of and be uh, talk to other people about may be quite different from your high school chemistry teacher. So what stakeholders we have may look at the organization in a different way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are, I didn't share this part, but um, you're so caught up in that little glitch that happened in your life today. And we hope people would not go out and say, that's really bad. Our you know, organization is bad because this has happened. But in general, I see with the people who have left, etc., that when they're able to take uh, a step back and look at the organization as a whole and the overall experiences, they tend to be positive. Mm. How about you, Kunisa? Uh, in the companies, often happens to uh, some people are very engaged, but some people are not engaged. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the company, it's the semiconductor company. 
so industry is changing very, very fast. Mm. Technology is changing very fast. So some engineers is uh, chasing the technologies. And then the, we can invest lots of money to the engineering. So some people love it. Mm. So, but the some other, other hand, for example, my company is just uh, 70 years old, quite a new company. So organization is changing all the time. Philosophies, not philosophies, but policies are changing all the time. Mm. So some people can't really catch up. Mm -hmm. So some people complain about it, I really want to do this or do this, and then some people just left. Can't follow. So trying to, trying to build that pride to get that engagement is a tricky area because, as you say, many stakeholders, different groups, some are in, some are out. So how do we think about that? What can we do to try and make that happen? And we found that there was an emotional <coughs> trigger in people that would lead to engagement. And that emotional trigger was the feeling of being valued. Now, again, as we talked before, there's often an assumption that, of course, you're valued. Of course, we value you. We don't ever tell you that. We don't ever show you that, particularly. We don't communicate it to you. But trust me, you're valued. Well, it doesn't work because people don't get the message. So again, the leadership forgets to tell people that they're valued. We found that when people understood their role in the company was important, uh, they were appreciated for what they were doing. The company was proud of them. They were valued. It started to trigger inspiration, enthusiasm, empowerment, and importantly, confidence. Particularly, confidence is a critical one because if we ask people to innovate, if we ask people to change, we're asking them to go out of their comfort zone and take on the risk of something that they're not good at immediately. And so how you treat people when you ask them to step out has a big impact on their confidence. And Japan is a bit of a tough business culture in a way because there's so much pressure not to make a mistake in Japan. So you've got this contradiction of please be innovative and step up and take a risk, but if you make a mistake, whack, straight away. And so people go, oh, that was a bad experience. I know how to avoid that. Never innovate again. Never step out of my comfort zone again. Never take a risk again. And so over time, people have learned to have that behaviour that's safe. But as companies, we don't want that safe behaviour. We want an innovative behaviour. We need the confidence. So when you feel valued and you feel, oh, I can take a risk, I can step up, I can innovate, I'm not going to get whacked by my boss, then it gives you that confidence to try. And all those things lead us up the scale to feeling engaged. So if you have your mobile phones with you, please get them out. We're going to have a little poll here. And we're going to ask, in fact, I'll, I can probably give you these. I think there's probably enough to go around. You can actually take a photograph of the uh, QR code. That's probably enough. You've got a, well, there's probably enough for everybody here, I'd say. We've got a QR code there and some questions. OK. And we've got a camera ready. There you go. There we go. There we go. I think we've got probably... There we go. We've got a couple over here there. OK. So we're going to get you to take a, a quick poll on these questions. So organisations that employ proud and engaged people hold the following characteristics. Now, which statement does your organisation struggle with the most? So here's a series of statements. Employees feel the corporate philosophy reflects their own values. Do your people struggle with that? Employees believe their organisations hold strong ethics. Do your people struggle with that? Employees feel the organisation respects and values them. Employees believe there's an opportunity for development and career growth. Do they struggle with that? They're proud of the contribution the organisation makes to the community. Employees are enabled and empowered to make decisions. Do you struggle with that? And finally, employees look forward to and are energised by coming to work. So if you think about all those statements, we just pick one. Which one do you think is the most difficult for your organisation to deliver? Is everyone clear on that? 
So you just pick one. All you need to do is take out your phone, uh, hit on that QR code, or there's also, if that doesn't work for you, you, don't have, you can go to um, this address. I'll bring it up. This address here, if you go into your browser and just put that address into your browser, it'll bring up the polling questions, and you can actually select your answer on your phone and then take part in the poll. Oh, there we go, 10 responses. So we're pretty much, I think, there. Everyone's, everyone who's entered is entered, so we finished at 10. Is that about right? So what does it come out of? We see that both uh, number six and number seven <coughs> came up as issues around um, making employees feel enabled and empowered to make decisions was an issue. And finally, uh, looking forward to an energised to go to work was also uh, another big issue. And then... Number four, there's an opportunity for development and career growth. Now, it's a small number uh, to compare with today, but let me just unplug that for a minute and show you what... Uh, this is a mixed group today. See what the Japanese group yesterday voted on. Yesterday was about, uh, I don't know, about 40 people, I think, um, all Japanese, and this was how they ranked it. So you see for them... Number six came up, but not necessarily number seven. And number four didn't, didn't come up much. Um, but number one came up. But for your group, it didn't come up that highly. So it's sort of interesting that they, they took a little bit of a different view on the subject. Okay, yes? Can I ask you, what kind of companies were these? Again, it's, it's very, you know, a bit like today, from all different industries and sectors and industries. No... No one consistent group. It was a very mixed bag, actually. Younger, middle, older individuals as well. So quite a, you know, quite a good, good scattered group to, to look at. So what do you think this tells us about what people are struggling with in terms of getting their engagement going? Because we're talking, in your case, you mentioned that uh, number seven looking forward to energise coming to work, what do we need to do to get them to feel like that? Or uh, you also had 30% was enabled and empowered to make decisions. What do we need to enable people to feel they can make decisions? What are we not doing that we could be doing? You know? And the other big one for, for this group was um, number four, uh, which was around opportunities for development and career growth, which often can be a communication aspect. So what do you think we could do to help people to feel, I want to come to work, I feel empowered, uh, I'm feeling like you know, my, my career is going somewhere. What can we do? Again, in your groups, have a brief discussion. of What are some things we could do to get that mindset working so that we could overcome where we think some of the key problems are that you've identified? Okay, okay let's see what you've found. So, Rick. Anything come up? We can think about some of these issues. Here's what I'm thinking, especially looking at the data from Japan. Uh, I think issue number one and six relates to uh, lack of communication with management, you mm -hmm. know, or a, a lack of participation involved. So, if they feel the corporate philosophy does not reflect their own values, we're missing communication there. Mm -hmm. And if they feel that they're not empowered and that their voice is not there, then that's also a lack of communication with management. So, I think both of those issues are related to that. Mm -hmm. Joyce, how about in your case? What do you think? Um, we all agreed on number six, and then we were just discussing about like maybe it's much to do with the say Japanese people, the mentality of Japanese people, because they're always very satisfied and content, even that they have a new idea coming into their head. They would just like go on, work very hard and seriously on what they have been asked to do, rather than to propose saying, "Oh, I have a new idea. Maybe this would work better and actually give a better result." Mm -hmm. So maybe that's. Um, what this maybe that partially engaged group that I do my work, but I'm not going to make that discretionary effort or put myself at risk by suggesting an idea that might get, you know, criticised perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about over here? What did you think? You guys on? Um, actually, we... Um, yeah, um, we didn't talk about much about this, but... Um, what do you think about in the Japanese group they, uh, they put the biggest 
the biggest problem areas here in uh, number six and, and number one. Do you think that's, that reflects reality in your company as well? Or would you pick, some, you pick something else? Which one did you select yourself? Um, in case of my company, um, well, our company is not a Japanese company, so um, I feel like the company, um, how to say, value the uh, different, there are our own values, and also, I think, yeah, each of the employees can make a decision, and then manager empower the employees, so um, it doesn't apply to my company. Mm -hmm. Which one does apply to your company? Um, maybe number five. Number five, okay. Employees are proud of the contributions the organisation makes to the community. That's interesting. So there's a bit of a disconnect with the local organisation and the country you're in. We just focus on working and then um, we don't have opportunity to like, feel like connect to the society or right. community. Right, right. So there's a bit of a gap there. Well, you know, very interesting. We have this quote. Bob Kelleher uh, is a bit of a specialist around engagement. He's got a whole company that looks at this issue, he writes books on the subject. And he's talking in this quote here that a company where employees feel comfortable participating in dialogue with anyone at any time, no matter how senior, is a company well on its way to being an engaged culture. Now, I think in many Japanese companies, because of the seniority system, uh, people at the bottom would very much hesitate to speak to a very senior person in the company would very much, uh, you know, not feel, not feel comfortable in having a dialogue with anyone any time. So what does that tell us about getting an engaged culture? If you've got this top-down, rather rigid hierarchy, it's hard to have an engaged team. You're going to have people who are compliant, who are partially engaged, lots of them, but hard to have innovation, hard to have everyone really pulling together. So... In your own companies, do you think that's the case? Is it such that the environment is you could talk to someone, a very senior person, any time, anywhere basically, and feel comfortable about that? What do you think? Is that the case? How about what do you think, Josh? You're new to the company. Do you think you feel very empowered now? You can sort of turn up and talk to the, the very, very senior people? Um, personally? Or? Yeah, <laughs> your case, you know? <laughs> you, yeah, you, exactly, you. Yes, yes. You Personally, do? I, yes, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. How about your colleagues? Would your colleagues also be similarly comfortable? I don't know if all the colleagues would be so. I don't know mm -hmm. if all of them would be. If Chacho tour walk in the room and say, what do you guys think? I don't know if everyone would be raising their hand. No. Well, how about over, over Coke? What do you think? Um, it depends on the main position, like very middle position. They're like the talking to the senior just a lot, but if there's a very junior, like just join from the college after graduate, have like need or courage to talk with them. Do you remember the video about Google that the person made the comment that uh, anyone who started even yesterday, if they've got a good idea, we're ready to hear it. We value their contribution, no matter how new or how junior they are. Everyone's got something to contribute. We're interested in hearing about it. So that's, that's a culture they've created to allow people to feel very comfortable and to be engaged and to put their eyes up. So there's something about an organisational construct and culture that's going to help us to get to deliver that type of thinking. So how do we become the employer of choice? So if we are, and this is in your manuals on page, what is it now, page six, I think. So you see there, it talks about the organisation itself. It has an outstanding product or service. It is reliable, it's trustworthy, it's dependable. Um, the employees, the customers, the suppliers recommend the company. Word of mouth is very positive about the company. And this leads to more revenue and bigger market share. Now, from the employee point of view, they see it as a great place to work. This is a great place to work. They feel that it's got a, someone cares. I'm valued. We talked about that before, right? Creative, inclusive. I can make my suggestions and people listen to me. 
There are plenty of opportunities for me to grow and develop my experience in this organization. And they recommend it to others, like, you know, come and work here. This is a great place to work, as you said to your friend, okay? And uh, a high potential A player champion workplace, this means the people who are going to move right to the top have a feeling this is a place I should stay working at because I have a place to go. And then from the customer point of view, oh, this company, they're a really great company to deal with. Um, they're consistent, exceptional service. It's, it's really excellent. Um, we recommend it. Yeah, you should use that company. They are a great supplier to us. You, they're going to be very good for you. Um, they're not just a transactional partner. They're a relationship partner giving us extra value. And a lot of brand loyalty around that. So when you think about companies globally, in fact, it's in your, in your manuals, I think, there. It's asking you about global and local there. Let me pull this out. Okay. What do you think? What would be some companies uh, globally that would fit that criteria, that would be hitting all three as a employer of choice? You know, what would be some local companies, you think, that would fit that criteria? And how about your own company? Is your own company, would your own company measure up and be an employer of choice? So again, in your groups, have a think about globally, locally, and your own company. What would be companies that qualify as employers of choice? It means that employer of choice is uh, so many people want to work there. They've got the pick of the best people because it's very much um, high demand to join that organisation. All right, so let's think about some... Examples internationally, globally, some local examples in Japan, and then think about your own organisation. So please have a discussion on that, and then we'll hear your, your thoughts on that. Please go ahead. OK, let's hear what you thought about that question. So what was an example globally or internationally of a company you would think was an employer of choice? Did anyone come up with any companies came to mind? Uh, P&G, Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble, yes. Very famous, yes. Employer Google. of choice. Sorry? Google. Yes, Google in the video before. Who else do you think would be good? Apple. Apple. Zappos. Zappos, yeah. yeah. Sorry? Facebook. Facebook, yes. Another one, isn't it? How about here in Japan? Who would be an employer of choice to be in these categories in Japan? Dentsu. Dentsu, yeah. Yeah. Who else? Sony, yeah. Any other examples? <laughs> Sorry? Toyota, yes. Toyota, yes, of course. How about your own companies? How did you go when you started to think about that? Are we an employer of choice? Are we hitting these points in a way that how we are as an organisation, how our people feel about working there and how the customers feel about us? How did you go? Did anyone feel that their company... Qualified as an employer of choice? Yes, we did. Very good. Excellent. That's the shot. And one reason is because that we've had uh, employees who have worked there and then gone abroad and worked other places for other companies but have wanted to return. And so... Uh, the grass was not greener on the other side of the fence after all. Is that what they found? Mm, they appreciate what they had before. Now, isn't that ironic, isn't it, that we actually leave to discover what we had was pretty good? And, again, it came to your point before, about communication. If we're really communicating and telling people, we're proud of you, you know, we value you, we appreciate you, they're less likely to leave, they're highly engaged while they're there, and they add a lot more value to the whole organisation. Now, there's another... This is also in your manuals on page... Uh, I think it's page 8, 7, 7, yes. <coughs> now, these... This is an acronym, but these are some things we came up with that seem to help us to become an employer of choice. And as you see there, um, clear sense of where we're going. Remember that idea before about engagement, that the senior management knows what they're doing, 
there's a clear purpose in what we're doing. It's very obvious to everybody because it's communicated where we're going with this. Responsible, okay, so you are accountable as a company, you're accountable in your industry. Inclusive, you're getting people involved, you're valuing their opinions, it's getting that discretionary effort from people because they feel comfortable and trusted to make that effort. Distinct, something unique, something differentiated about the organisation, be it the value proposition, whatever. And then ethical, okay, compliant, it's transparent, following the rules, very, you know, clear we say one thing and we do the same thing. We don't say one thing and do something else. So maybe we might make, make one group here and let's make one group here and just go through these and think about the relevancy of these for building an employer of choice culture in your organisation. What could you do with these that you're not doing now to start to create that employer of choice culture in your own organisation? So let's make one group here, let's make one group here and discuss that. How do we use these? What can we do with these items here to build that employer of choice mentality? All right, let's, let's hear what we thought about that. You have some things here to create that employer of choice culture. Did you think these were applicable? Do you think these are good elements to create that? How did you think in this group? What did you think, Catherine? What was working here? Um, for our institution, <coughs> the one that we felt we probably need to put more effort into is uh, the inclusive, involve and recognize employees, promote diversity, encourage, particularly encourage idea exchange and more, mm -hmm. to probably provide some platform where there will be more exchange of um, ideas. Mm. We do recognize people, but there naturally there may not be a time for uh, all of the employees to be exchanging ideas. Mm. So it's, there are clusters of different meetings mm. going on. And that happens, doesn't it? We get into our work groups and we're all very busy. And we've got companies full of very busy people in small groups. And sometimes we forget that there's something in that whole of group activity and capacity for thinking and sharing that's going to add a lot of value to the company, but we don't tap into it because we're just very busy. And so when we're talking about getting in high levels of engagement here, becoming the employer of choice, taking some time to tap into that, it's going to have a big impact on the employees who feel my opinion was sought after. I had a chance to express my ideas and they were taken up by the company. You know, we're changing the world, as Google said in that video, that what you're working on here goes around the world. It's visible. But a lot of our jobs are not that visible, you know, like... We work very hard, but no one's going to see it. But within the company, if it's seen, that will encourage people. Like, how about Coke? You've got a big organisation there. We have to tick all the boxes here, all working for you? Actually, um, yes, our company is everything I think we are covering, but do we need to do more. Mm -hmm. Which ones do you think you need to do more on? It's like more purposeful for it. We have mm -hmm. all the vision, mission, by everything. Mm -hmm. Now, they know the pieces we have. The only thing is, they don't really record every day, mm -hmm. so they tend to forget about it. Yep. So we have to communicate more repeatedly, and then that will be more embedded uh, to each people. Yep. Then maybe they can walk a talk, yep. our mission is done, to the um, outside of the company. Mm. Now they understand, we have a mission, we have a value, but they don't know what the value is. That's right. I do a lot of training in companies who have beautifully framed vision, mission, value statements on the wall. And one of my favourite activities is to go in and take it off the wall, turn it around and stick it against the wall and then ask the people in the audience, what's your company's vision? What's your company's mission? And uh, invariably, no one remembers the vision because it's usually way too long. Too many words, you know, the president's got this really elaborate vision statement which no one can remember. 
What does that tell you straight away, right? There's a problem there. Mission, they're a bit cross. They'll usually get, they usually around about five values. They usually get around two or three between the whole group. You know? <laughs> right? So it tells you that even though the senior leadership may think what they're doing is purposeful and that they're communicating because they've promulgated this, it's actually not working. Because I can tell you right now, if you can't remember it, I don't know how you can live it. <laughs> if you don't know what the values are, I don't know how you can exude those values as a representative of the company or within the company. How about on this side? How about, how about for you? How did you go? How do you think your company goes here, Joyce? Um, I think actually my company is doing quite well due to the pride of <laughs> being an employer of choice because um, it's a local company expanding into um, Asia and then to globally and it's still very young and uh, small scale. Mm -hmm. So I think message is um, very easily conducted by the president within the team and then to other consultants. So actually, like I think um, we reach quite a good level and we're expanding further. So. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have much um, criticism for it. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Kunisa? Um, yes, my company is doing well, but we have to work on maybe increasing on this. Similar to this comment over here before? Yeah, mm -hmm. very yeah. yeah. And that thing about we are proud of you, you know, telling you people we are proud of you, it's one of those things, of course we're proud of you. We just never tell you about it, you know. We, it's one of those things when you... you go through this type of process, you start to realise there's a lot of assumptions we're making here that are passing for communication, which are not actually communication. They're just assumptions. Let's take the assumptions, leave those aside and make them actual communications which are direct to people and tell them that directly. It has a big impact because <laughs> there's not much of it going around, you know. I mean, I'll put up your hand in any company you've ever worked in, that your boss has said to you, we are proud of you. One. Okay. It's a rare, it's a rather rare comment. You know, that was a good job, you did the project well, type of praise, usually fairly weak praise, but not very specific praise. But we are proud, that's a, like a sort of assumed thing, we don't need to express it. But this tells us that we should think about expressing it more. Well, on the next page, we have a little cycle here um, that uh, let me bring up here. Some success steps. And this is fairly, fairly obvious planning. You know, start with what we're doing now. Create that culture that encourages engagement. So think about the things we've talked about. What do you need to do in the culture that you have now that's going to really generate more engagement. And communication is bound to be a big factor in that. And then occasionally measure it. We know that what gets measured gets done. So we need to have some way of testing whether we're actually getting anywhere with our engagement or not. And then, of course, we need... So if we're not getting the engagement levels we want, what's an actual plan to get that? Again, very obvious. And then hold managers accountable for improving. Now, in some companies, they have KPIs, key performance indicators, around revenue numbers, quality numbers, and also around engagement numbers. So as companies do surveys and they see there's a certain level, and usually Japan's lower than everywhere else. <laughs> in all the companies I've worked in, it's always lower than everywhere else. And so there's an effort to get the managers accountable to start thinking about how they can get those engagement levels to come up. And then, finally, recognise and reward progress, of course. All very, very straightforward. On page nine, the next page, it's asking for us to think about yourself and what can I do personally to have some impact here. And looking for a commitment that we can actually write down now and what will I do that will help to increase the feeling that our company, our organisation is an employer of choice. What can I do? It's no good saying the company should do this or they up there, senior management, should do that. This is asking you, whatever level or whatever role you have in the company, what can you do to make a difference? So just take some time and go through this. So you nominate your organisation. Uh, you know, it might be... Uh, 
working with an employee, you can have an impact. Uh, it might be working with a customer, you can have some impact. You might think about uh, something you can do within your department around that PRIDE acronym that we went through before. And then how will you know if your actions are having an impact? So let's take a few moments and make that commitment to take some action and start to make a difference in our organisations. So what can you do in the organisation have an impact? What can you do with the uh, other employees that you work with? What can you do with a customer to have some impact? Taking those choices, the PRIDE, the purposeful, the responsible, inclusive, distinct, ethical, taking that idea, what can I do? Taking one of these on board and do something with it to actually have impact. Then how will I know I'm succeeding? How can I measure my activity? How will I know this is having some positive impact on the organisation? So let's hear what some of the words were amongst that PRIDE acronym that you chose for yourself to have an impact on your organisation. So, Jan Zaksan, which one did you choose? Which word is going to be the one for you? <clears throat> I think ethical is the most important um, for myself. Mm -hmm. And how will you measure if your efforts in that area are being successful? Um... That's a very hard question, but... Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's difficult. I guess one of the behaviours I, I judge how ethical people are, myself, is, is, is how you spend the money. If you spend, like, as if it's your money, not the company's money, on any kind of expenses, then that's one of the, the ethical standards that I was referring to, so mm. I can see you know, from the behaviour. Yep. How you spend money. Mm -hmm. Okay, Josh, how about you? Uh, Which word did you choose? Inclusive. Inclusive, yeah. And what are you going to do to make it more inclusive there? Um, one of our goals for, uh, for our company is to um, increase the interaction with our global counterparts. Ah, okay. Right. Um, so within the same organization? Within the same organization. Mm -hmm. So okay. if, if I can help facilitate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How about you? What do you think? What's going to be a key word for you, do you think? Um, responsible. Responsible, okay. So right. I, I picked that one because uh, I certainly feel the, the team is in that disengaged category. Ah, okay. And responsible will play a couple of key roles because, one, it's giving back CSR. Uh -huh. That becomes more and more important as we respond to RFPs. You know, companies mm -hmm. want to know that you're a responsible company, and then how specifically are you giving back to the community? Mm -hmm. the other, there's lots of studies out there that uh, organizations that participate in CSR type of activities, mm -hmm. their workforce tends to be much more engaged. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking if I can create, because uh, in the past there has been very little to no effort um, okay. that locally, mm -hmm. so I will give each employee uh, two days mm. to uh, focus on initiatives around mm -hmm. CSR activities, whatever they want to to get involved in up mm. to two days in, in the year. And what I'd like to see is more people getting involved, so just tracking numbers or people making use of that day or two mm -hmm. days. You can actually measure that, yes, easily, yeah. And then, um, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see some real signs of the, the team coming together, they're mm -hmm. more engaged, they're more, uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're happier about um, getting involved. I had a meeting last week with Make-A-Wish Foundation. Okay. Well. So they're, they're here in Japan, they've been here for 20 years, but they're not really uh, mm -hmm. as well known. Mm. as they are in, in the some States, other yeah. parts, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, the reason I said chose them is because I saw that YouTube video of the Batman, Make-A-Wish Foundation, yep. Jason yep. did the, yep. the, the one on, uh, in San Francisco. Yep. He created Gotham City and had 2,000 volunteers in the city. Um, so, you know, I just want to get some the, the staff excited and mm. engaged in, 
that's, that's one thing that I'll plan to do this year. All right, and you can measure it too. Annette, how about you? Um, so, in the inclusive, um, uh, so about encouraging, with the encouragement of idea exchange, I was thinking uh, how important it is to actually not just get all the ideas, but actually to go back and give feedback on what happened with the ideas. Yeah. And what you did with them. Yeah. Mm. What action could be taken yeah. together, uh, or or what the ongoing issues might be that it couldn't action couldn't be moved on yet straight away. Mm. Um, and what the challenges might be, so that then they can have more of appreciation of the big picture. Mm. Um, but that communication um, point is really important in that whole process of not just getting information, but feeding it back as well. Mm. Um, but how to measure? Yeah, how do you measure that? Do you have engagement surveys of the, the, the team now? Do you do that type of thing? No. 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 Mm -hmm. That might be something to think about. You could bring them in. The guy, son, how about you? Which word did you choose? Purposeful. Purposeful, OK. Yeah, you made a funny job. I've never heard that, right? People talk about vision or... No? Yeah. So you don't even have the thing on the wall framed, right? It's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, um, I don't actually. I don't know deeply about like vision of mm -hmm. the company or mm -hmm. my company. Mm -hmm. So this year, uh, I plan to go to uh, United States. I, I, I think um, I mean headquarters. Yes. Uh, to take a training. Yes. By headquarters, so maybe I should run. Yeah. While well, you're there, right? Maybe mm. um, Good. tell the tell yes. uh, colleague to yeah tell yeah. yeah. Um, yeah the vision to correct and then yeah. maybe I can measure by like the number of people talk about yeah. um, the value uh, yeah. vision or, yeah, yeah. Well, good point Joyce how about you for you um, I chose uh, inclusive as well and just simply it's like about um, idea exchange it's important to form good teamwork which I'm learning very much now at the moment and also to bring the best of each person's ability and the talent skills and knowledge from their own different experiences hmm. yeah. and how are you going to measure that um, well, that maybe relates to the last question of how I would know my actions have been making an impact. Mm -hmm. I just simply wrote um, through results. Through results, yes. okay. Easy. Shimura san, how about for you? I chose responsible. Okay, responsible, okay. Uh, we are uh, now, we are planning to train this year. I want to make some. Really good training. Program, yeah. Mm. We, uh, we measure, we, we measure after training questionnaire. Mm. Okay. Uh, going to high uh, comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we talk about, talk with for that. Yep. Get some yeah. feedback from them yeah. as well. Mm, okay, sounds good. All right. So, Kojima san, how about for you? Yeah, um, yes, mine is a kind of inclusive part. Inclusive, okay, yep. And then, yeah, we had the um, employee engagement survey recently, and then I'm kind of working with the function. To what can we do to make it better? Mm -hmm. I have a couple of functions in the church. I want to be more <coughs> inclusive to not the leader to decide what to do, but more involving these people. And then what I want to be is to facilitate these each function to make it better. Mm. And then I'm kind of thinking to um, involving a different function team as one team, mm. and then try to build more our company total yes. action plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be, we can exchange more different ideas from the different functions, which I want to facilitate. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to. All right. Uh, and how will you know if you're successful? The benchmark is the uh, engagement score for the... Oh, we're going up or not. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'm going to do the first survey in the end of this year. Ah, okay. Maybe that will help. That'll help, yeah. That'll tell you. That's the benchmark. Yeah, okay. Rick, how about you? Uh, I chose responsible. In, in essence, really, if, in my company, I'm responsible for engagement. So uh, in that sense, um, I want to, 
as a startup company, we're hiring new people right now. So I think the level of engagement we have right now is the highest that we can expect yep. uh, at the time. So, but I, my main uh, goal is to to maintain or or increase mm -hmm. that engagement going forward, mm -hmm. especially then, as you grow too. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, it's it's good to have that that uh, that vision and, and that mindset from the beginning. Mm. Uh, many people are coming from larger organizations and such, they might have found themselves kind of behind the curve mm. and trying to catch up and to make those changes. But uh, my situation is, is fortunate in that I can hopefully go in that direction from the beginning. Uh, I can measure it uh, after time with uh, some surveys with staff members and, and also a meeting one-on-one -on -one and, mm -hmm. and with the focus being on engagement and making sure that my expectations for how engaged they are are equal to what their realities are. Mm, okay. Okay, Quinsa. Which word did you choose? Inclusive. Inclusive. Inclusive comes up a lot today, doesn't <laughs> it? And what are you going to do about it and how will you measure it? I'm an HR person. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm working on it now. But mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can create a clear HR guideline mm -hmm. especially in the compensation part. Mm -hmm. Lots of employees complained about the compensation. Oh. Actually, because the, the, for example, merit increase or the performance bonus or another bonus is measured by only one uh, evaluation system. Oh, okay. So we have to define mm -hmm. a different way. So you've got a lot of work coming up there. That's a big task. Yeah. The hopefully, maybe the, the turnover rate will be lower. Uh -huh. <coughs> um, give them a Clear yeah. compensation. Mm. Well, you can measure it from the turnover. Okay, that's good. Catherine, how about you? How about you? Which word did you choose? Yes, oh, yes. I chose inclusive. Inclusive as well, okay. Yeah. And I think as far as action plan goes, looking at both the problem areas, there is some dichotomy of we, they. Mm. Right? Oh, all right, different camps. Okay. And maybe help. Uh, it will help if we can focus on uh, goals that are school-wide mm -hmm. and work together on how we can achieve that instead of just in small groups just mm -hmm. looking at only your one little area mm -hmm. and as you were talking about some kind of engagement survey mm. uh, that's something we don't have mm. and I think it would be really good. Could be easy to bring that in, like that. yeah. Well, thinking about on the last page of your manual here, it's, um, Asking for a couple of ideas that came up today for you that you may be able to take away from this session that helps you. So have a think about some ideas that you can use and just make a note of those because we're very, very focused on outcomes from the time you've spent here and sacrificed you know, your busy schedules, that you come out of this with something that's practical, ideas you can use, uh, that makes the time investment worthwhile. So just take a couple of minutes and isolate out a couple of things that you may have heard in your group discussions today or that came through in the presentation. You think, yep, at least there's an idea I've got. I'm going to do something or other from now on. Think about what they might be. If you've gotten through thinking of a couple of ideas from today, also in the documents you received today, there's a short, very, very short survey. So if you can just have a look in your paperwork, you may find a copy of that somewhere. And if you get a chance, please just give us some feedback on the things you found valuable today. We'll take that on board as we design our workshops for you to make sure that we're delivering what you're looking for. So if you haven't got one of these, let me know and we'll give you one. Did you get one of these, Connie-san? Did you get one? You got one? Okay. Great. They should be in the packs that you received. Yeah, we'll pick them up in, in a moment. In fact, we'll, we'll start to wrap it up here. And this is a great quote, actually, from Bob Kelleher about engagement. Never underestimate how much our team members want to work for a great company. We shouldn't presume that's not the case. It is the case. And so we start to make it a great company. They will respond. And I said before, there are some things you can do. Uh, you can run this workshop inside your company. You want to bring the engagement survey to your team. That survey, they went out globally. 
we can bring that in Japanese into the team and do it for you if you want to get an idea of how engagement's going. Or there might be a need for a customised program. There might be something you want to work on with your middle management or for your communication or an area that's an issue for you. Or uh, some of the courses are listed in the documentation that you have in front of you. We have got a lot of courses running all the time that you can send people to and join in those. If you don't want something customised to bring in-house, you want to send just a couple of people to the course, that's available. And uh, we will have further workshops. The engagement surveys we did initially were for mainly larger companies and they've just completed one for SMEs. And so we're just waiting now for the analysis of that SME survey, that um, small and medium enterprise survey, to come out and the findings, what that's going to show us about getting engagement in smaller size companies. So look for other workshops coming up uh, which will also deal with that. So let me end by thanking you very much for your time today and uh, the discussions you had. I felt they were very rich discussions and hitting on some critical areas. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at another Dale Carnegie event in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dale. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Leadership Japan series. If you found the program useful, then you might consider subscribing on iTunes. Remember to access your Dale Carnegie training free white papers, guidebooks, training videos, blogs, course information, newsletters, etc., 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 then go to japan.dalecarnegie.com.